Hey, welcome to New Life Online. I'm so glad that you're here today. And my hope is this, that you will get more connected to God and others. One of the ways that we do that is through the New Life Connect card. It's in the chat right now. You can fill it out. Maybe it's just your way of saying, I'm watching. Maybe it's a way to find a next step or a prayer request. And you can do that on the app anytime. This message and gathering is going out to encourage thousands of people and making a difference in people's lives. The reason that happens is through the generosity of new lifers. Maybe you're one who gives, and I wanna say thank you that this message can encourage so many people. If you're interested in giving or you wanna go online and give today, you can do that at newlife.tv slash give. Thank you for giving to make the mission happen. Today, I have an opportunity in the message to share with you some good news. I want you to tune in as we hear about the best good news ever.
It's like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting for you. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is waiting. Dance like the weight has been lifted. Grace is.
I'll never forget the day. It was summer. I was about eight or nine years old and me and my older brother had went to get the mail. We thumbed through the mail until we found one that stuck out to us. The one that stuck out to us was a personal letter from the one and only Ed McMahon. You know it, it was from Publishers Clearinghouse. Well, we opened that envelope right away and we were so delighted to read the news that we had been selected the winners of the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. Our dreams were finally realized. We started high-fiving and hugging and we started planning the toys that we would buy, the vacations that we would take, the school we never had to go to again. Our life was forever going to be different. We couldn't wait for our parents to get home to tell them the news. They walked in the door. We ran up to them as quickly as possible and said, Mom and Dad, you're not going to believe this. We won the Publishers Clearinghouse sweepstakes. To, to our surprise, our parents did not have the same reaction that we did. They did not have the same elation and excitement that we found. And it was in that moment that my mom and dad introduced my brother and I to this concept called the fine print. The details, the little tiny writing at the bottom that we had missed that unfortunately for us meant that we were not the winners of the publisher's clearinghouse. We were duped by a headline. And it's funny, you know, I found out that I'm not the only one that's ever been duped by a bad headline. And to make myself feel a little bit better, I've got a couple that I got to share with you. Here's the first one. It says this, cows lose their job as milk prices drop. That, that, that makes sense, right? Another one said this, Northfield plans to plan strategic plan. That sounds like a lot of planning in my opinion. And then this final one was this. I swear this one has to be from Western Washington. Here's literally, you'll see it, what it says. Forecasters call for weather on Monday. That sounds pretty accurate. And it's funny, we see these funny headlines, but there's also famous headlines that we've seen throughout history. In a day that was not too long ago, when the news used to show up at your doorstep in the morning, you would walk out, grab a newspaper, and read the news. There's famous ones such as man walks on the moon, a moment in history that'll never be forgotten. Maybe there's the other one that I read that says Mandela goes free, the moment when Nelson Mandela was freed from prison. Another one, the Titanic sinks after four hours striking an iceberg a day that everyone would remember. And then finally, one of my famous ones, and you know now this, to never trust a headline, is the famous one of Dewey defeats Truman. When President Truman held up that newspaper as he had actually won the presidential election, but a newspaper wanted to be the first to break the news, and they thought that Dewey would defeat Truman. There are these headlines that we see that are famous throughout history, and it makes me wonder what would the headlines of my life be? Maybe they'd be highlights like this. She said yes when I asked Sarah to marry me and my wife said yes. Maybe it says brewers welcome a baby boy as we had our firstborn son and brought him home. 
I think they'd read like that. Unfortunately, they read like some of my past Facebook statuses where I'm posting pictures of food, but that's a whole nother story. It's news, and our life is surrounded by news. There's news in our own life, there's news in the world around us, and we actually live in this time with a 24-7 news cycle. It used to be on the paper. It used to be at six o'clock and maybe if you stayed up late at 11 o'clock, but now it's 24 seven. It's political news, it's local news, it's world news, it's sports news, it's gossip news. You can find it at your fingertips any time of the day. And there's actually been some studies, a, a doctor named Dr. Graham Davey, he's a psychologist, and he did an extensive study on what news is doing to us as people. And he said that the news cycles in the last 10 to 20 years have grown increasingly not only negative, but increasingly graphic due to things like viral videos. And he found this, that our saturation with news has led to increasingly negative and fear-laden news stories, and that leads to anxiety, depression, and acute stress, just from the constant barrage of news in our lives. There was actually a newspaper. They decided to do a case study. And one day, all they ran was positive news stories. I'd like to tell you that everyone was happy, but here's what happened. Their viewership dropped by two-thirds just by sharing good news. We actually live in a time where we perpetuate this bad news cycle, and it actually starts to affect us. And so I want to go back to me as a nine-year-old sitting on my kitchen floor, publisher's clearinghouse in hand. Would we believe good news? Or have we become so jaded and so cynical that we can't even accept good news when we see it? We have to think, well, what's the catch? Or where's the fine print? Or what are the strings that are attached with this news? And so for some of us, good news is not even news anymore. It's something that we simply can't believe. But as we kick off this series, Good News People, there's some things that we can all agree on. Number one is this, there's lots of bad news. I don't need to tell you that. We see it each and every day. There's lots of bad news. Number two, the world could use more good news. And we're gonna talk about how that happens through good news people. And then number three, the gospel is the best news. We believe that the gospel is the best good news that there is. Because when it comes to news, there's kind of a gauge. And we'll all probably agree on this. At the bottom of this gauge is bad news. Nobody likes to hear bad news. That's at the bottom. The next one we have up from there is probably no news. And you might've heard the old saying, no news is good news. Some of you filled it in. Some of you think no news makes you nervous, makes you anxious. The next one is just news. There's things that just inform you on things that are going on. We get news every single day from little things to big things. And then the next one up from there is we say good news. But there's a catch. Sometimes this good news is only good for some people. For example, a political election. Someone wins and someone loses. It's good news for some, but bad news for the other. Or how about this news headline? Tom Brady wins the Super Bowl. Again, now that's good news for a small few, but for the rest of us, news like that is not good news. We think this, there's something even greater, and it's called this, the best good news. That means it's this, it's good news for me, it's good news for you, and it's actually good news for the entire world, and we call that the best good news. And actually, they use that word in, in Scripture, in the New Testament. It's a word called euangelion, and that word actually means good news. We're going to jump into exactly what that word looked like in the context where we're going to read it from Colossians today. And here's what that word would mean. That word comes from the word good in the Greek, an angel or messenger. And so those two words make up good news. Now, in the Roman world and in that time, that would be a message that was proclaimed often. They would, they would proclaim, euangelion, it means good news. Here's what that would normally mean, that there was an enemy of Rome that was defeated. The emperor had won. It means that the kingdom had expanded. It means that there was good news. But here's the thing. It wasn't always good news for everyone. 
And good news most of the time meant this, that an enemy of Rome had been defeated. An enemy of Rome had been killed. And so it wasn't good news for those who had been defeated. It also wasn't good news for those that found themselves on the underside of power. Here's what that meant, more oppression. It meant more taxes. It meant more rules. And so that, that word euangelion was not good news for all in the Roman world. And then comes the story of Jesus and the followers of Jesus. And they start to declare the story of the gospel, of the good news, and they use that word. They start to use the word euangelion, good news, gospel, and they're using it for this, the story of Jesus. They're not using it for the fact that somebody died, but for the fact that somebody was raised again to life, and that person was Jesus. And it wasn't just good news for them. It wasn't just good news for a small group. It was good news for the entire world. It was gospel. It was good news. And the gospel is the best good news. We proclaim it wherever they went. That gospel is talked about in 2 Timothy 2.8. Paul's writing to Timothy and he says this, that the gospel, the good news is this. Jesus Christ, a descendant of King David, was crucified, buried, and rose again from the dead. That's the good news. The good news is that God is reconciling man, that Jesus came to earth as a savior to forgive us of our sins and set us free. That's the story of the gospel. That's the story of the good news. And as we see from the scripture, Colossians 1, 6, we're gonna read it together. It talks about what this good news does and what this good news brings. Here's what Paul says. That same good news that came to you is going out all over the world. It's bearing fruit everywhere by changing lives, just as it changed your lives from the day you first heard and understood the truth about God's wonderful grace. It's that same good news, the news of the gospel. It's going out all over the world. Jesus seemed to think that the news would spread all over, and that's exactly what it did. This church that was started in Colossa that Paul is writing to, he had never even visited. The good news had even gone further than Paul's ministry at this time because good news spreads. And we see finally, it changes lives. It changed my life. I'm sure for many of you, it's changed your life. And so that's what the good news does. It actually changes lives. I've been asking this question as we kick off this series. How do I become a good news person? The world needs more good news people. How do I become that? It made me think of one of my favorite restaurants. I got to admit this to you, even though I'm from Washington, I love in and out. I believe it's where God's blessing lies, is it in and out. And I remember the first time having in and out. When I had it, what did I do? I posted on social media about it. I told my friends who had gone to in and out as well. I talked to friends who hadn't gone to it and told them, you have to experience it. What if I became that passionate about the gospel? What if we became that passionate about, about what we'd experienced in Jesus that we told everyone? I thought that a double-double animal style with fries and a Neapolitan shake changed my life, but imagine if I did that with the gospel. We've experienced the gospel when we say yes to Jesus. We should be the ones living and spreading that message. And so the questions I've been asking is how do I become a good news person? How do we become good news people? For when we experience it, we become a messenger of it. And one of the questions I've been asking myself is this, how am I loving people? I know that it sounds so simple and yet it's so powerful. If you look at the story of the early church, the thing they were known by was their love, the way that they loved others. It wasn't their theology necessarily. It wasn't a set of rules. They were known for how they loved people. Am I known for how I love people? Am I loving people the way that Jesus loves people, the way that Jesus loves me? And not just loving people that look like me and think like me and act like me, but how am I loving those that I like the least? How am I loving people in Jesus' name? How is the good news changing the way that I love people? Paul wrote in verse four when he's writing the same letter, for we've heard of your faith in Jesus and your love for all of God's people. 
They heard about their love. That's how the good news spread, by how they were loving people. One of my favorite authors, Bob Goff, wrote it like this in his book, Love Does. He says, this is what love does. It pursues blindly, unflinchingly, and without end. When you go after something you love, you'll do anything it takes to get it, even if it costs everything, because that's what love does. That's what good news people do. And when we see it, we know it. I saw it over this past month in my friend Ashton's life, and I got a view into it from the world of Facebook. And she posted on February 13th about a man that she met in a laundromat. And the story went like this. We met a homeless guy under a bridge. We shared with him about Jesus, repentance, baptism, and the Holy Spirit. I gave him a Bible. And through tears, he thanked me and said nobody had ever done that for him before. God is powerful. That was on February 13th. Just over two weeks later, this week, on March 1st, the story continued this way. Two weeks ago, we shared the gospel with a homeless man named Roy. Yesterday, I had the privilege of baptizing him in water and praying for him to receive the Holy Spirit, and he was born again. Today, he sent me a text, and he said the peace that passes all understanding is his today. And there's a picture right now of Ashton and her new friend Roy, who had just said yes to following Jesus Sometimes we want a formula. We want a three easy steps to love people. But Paul seemed to think in 1 Corinthians 13, love does a lot of things. And it's something that you know it when you see it. When you see somebody love, when you see sacrificial love, when you see the way the gospel loves, you'll know it when you see it. And my goal in my life is to see it more. To see it more in the people I interact with the most to see it in our church, to see it in our community, the love that only happens through the gospel. One of the questions I'm asking is, am I loving people? Another question that I ask is this, where am I putting my hope? In verse five, Paul goes on to say this, this comes from your confident hope of what God has reserved for you in heaven. You have this expectation ever since you first heard the truth of the good news. I gotta admit something to you. There's something that I don't do very well. I don't put things back in their place. And maybe you have kids like I do. I have a seven-year-old and a four-year-old, and they're not great at putting things back where they belong. Here's the problem when you don't put something where it belongs. When you need it, you don't know where to find it. You'll go looking for it and searching for it, and you won't find it because it wasn't put in the right place. Where are you putting your hope? Is your hope in the right place? Is your hope in a place that will last? Are you living out the hope of good news people, which is in the gospel and the story of Jesus? I know if I were to ask you, have you ever let, been let down? The answer would be yes, we all have. And so we're all a little bit jaded or a little bit cynical when it comes to hope. But Romans talks about the hope we have in Jesus that will not lead to disappointment. Where am I putting my hope? It comes down sometimes to where am I spending my time and where am I spending my money? And if I look at that in my own life, am I putting my confident hope in Jesus or am I putting it in my own abilities? Am I putting it in the government? Am I putting it in leadership? Am I putting it in money or in my job or in my hobbies or my security? And when I do that, I'm not putting it in the right place. And those things aren't bad things, but we never take a good thing and make it a God thing. Our confident hope is meant to be put in Jesus alone. And as good news people, we have this confident hope, not only for this life, but for the life to come. And that confident hope is in Jesus. As a good news person, I need to be putting my hope in Jesus. The third question I've been asking is this, what am I expecting? That verse five talks about you have this expectation ever since you heard the truth of the good news. I've heard it say this way, what you expect will determine what you experience. Have you ever felt that to be true? That when you go into something with a good expectation, good things happen. But when you look for the negative, you can also find that as well. When it comes to our daily rhythm and our daily life, what are you expecting? Where are your expectations? If I'm not careful, I can find myself getting negative. 
I can find my attitude, I can find my expectations becoming negative in my own mind. Even when the first thing I do is wake up in the morning, if I don't set my heart right, if I don't set my heart on God, if I don't do that, many times it determines what I experience. Psychologists say some of the most important thoughts you have throughout the day are the first ones you have when you wake up. And when we follow Jesus, we expect good things to happen because we are good news people. My question is, what are you expecting out of your family? Are you expecting things to go bad? Are you expecting your coworkers and you not to get along? Your boss out to get you? Your neighbors just out for themselves? And is that what you're experiencing? Or are you expecting to have opportunities every day with your kids to show them how much you love them? Opportunities with your spouse to serve them and to experience God's love together. With your friends, are you expecting them to be pointing you to Jesus? With your job, are you looking at it like an opportunity to point people to the good news? It's like my friend Tara, who during Freedom February, her daughter started a spare change fundraiser as a challenge at New Life Kids. Tara went to work and told her coworkers about it because she saw it as an opportunity and an expectation that they would jump into the fight against human trafficking. And here's what happened. Over $400 was raised by her coworkers because she expected good news, because she expected good things. Our expectations can many times change our experience. Are you expecting what God has promised? It's not an expectation and expectation alone. It's not send good vibes to the universe and it sends it back. It's a confident hope that's only found in Jesus and we expect God to be who he said he would be in our lives, in our community, and in our world. That's what good news people do. They expect God to be God. Now the scripture says this, what happens when we do it? Whenever I'm asked to do something, I always want to know, well, what's the end result? And so Paul talks about what's the end result. Number one, he said this, it's going to bear fruit. Now bear fruit, what does that mean? I always go to the fruit of the spirit. What's going to happen if we live out good news people? Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Those sound like things that are worth investing into. And so when I am a good news person and I live that out because of the gospel, I'm going to see those things in my own life, in my family, and in my community. The other thing he says is it changes lives. We have changed lives all around us. We get to see those when the gospel takes root in somebody's life. And it's not only good news for my life, but it's also good news for the entire world. Wherever the gospel goes, good news spreads. And we know that when we live as good news people, it will change lives. In verse 7, Paul actually mentions somebody who's a good news person, Epaphras. And he talks about what his journey of faith and him being a good news messenger has done for the world around him. Now, I want to tell you back up who he is. Epaphras would have been in the crowd when Paul was preaching and literally ran out of town. So his preaching didn't go well. He got ran out of town, but Epaphras was there. And he took that message of the good news and went to Colossae and started that church. Because the good news spreads wherever it goes. He was a good news person in his life and in the community. Who's a good news person in your life? Maybe you look around you and there needs to be somebody who is a good news person at your place of work, in your family, in your community, because I believe this and it leads to our action point. Let the good news change how you live. The Bible says faith, if not accompanied by action, is dead. Good news, if not followed by a life that lives it out, is dead. And when we share the good news, it should change the way that we live. You know, on September 2nd of 1945, it was Harry S. Truman that stood on the USS Missouri and he signed the end of World War II. September 2nd, 1945, World War II ended. The fighting was supposed to be over. And the crazy thing about it is the news didn't make it everywhere. The news didn't spread the way that it should. 
The war was over, it was done, and yet there are actual reports and stories of people fighting for years after because they never received the news. One of those stories was two years later in 1947 that soldiers found a newspaper on their way to get water that finally showed them that the war was over. The news had never actually reached them, so it didn't change the way that they lived. With us, with me, with you, the gospel has reached you because the gospel is good news for everyone that hears it. Maybe it's your first time hearing it. Maybe you followed the gospel your whole life. It changes lives. And when we live that out, we become the good news people that the world lives. We get to share the story of the gospel wherever it goes. We get to share the story of death to life, of hopelessness to hopeful, of darkness to light. It's the good news story and we are the messengers. There's nothing more powerful than when we live out the good news that we believe in. That's what will change lives. That's what will bear fruit. That's what will change communities when we experience and live out the good news of the gospel. Let's be good news people wherever we go. I want to pray for you as we go. Jesus, thank you for the news of the gospel the good news that's found in Jesus Christ. God, I pray that that would permeate our life, that it would become real to us, not only in the way that we believe, but in the way that we live. God, we live in a world that needs more good news. And not just fake good news, not just news that lasts for a minute, but the best good news. And that's the story of the gospel. God, I pray for those that have never heard the story of the gospel. Would they hear that there's a God in heaven that loves them? Jesus who died for their sins and wants to set them free to a life eternal. And today, would they say yes for the first time to the best good news of the gospel? For those of us that follow Jesus, would today be a day we're reminded that it is the best good news and it's more powerful when we live it out. Would we be good news people? In Jesus' name, amen. Shout of praise, we won't stop till we see your face. We live to shout of praise to the one who died in our place. We live to shout of praise, we won't stop till we see your face. We live to shout of praise to the one who died in our place. Your promise. Is our short every word you speak is pure? You are making all things right by your spirit. I'm alive, faithful. You have been from the grave, you rose again. Oh, death couldn't hold you down, so we raise a mighty sound. Every word you speak is
lift our voices to the one, the one who was and is to come, the one who died for me, his name is Jesus. We lift our voices to the one, the one.
Our world needs more good news people. If you have a story to share of good news, something that God has done in your life, something that you've seen in the world that you want to share, send in an email to stories at newlife.tv. I want to hear it. The team wants to hear it. We might even share it during this series called Good News People during the month of March. And one thing I want to make sure that you have on your calendar, March 14th, four o'clock is State of the Church. It's the one time a year our entire church gets together. Whether you've been watching online throughout this season or you show up at a New Life location, would you do this? Register today, whether you're gonna be attending in person or online, there are limited seats in person. I wanna know who's gonna be at State of the Church so that we can make sure you have the best experience ever. I think God has something really special that he's gonna speak to us as a church. Let's get ready for what it is that Jesus is leading us to next. Thanks for being here today. Have a great week on the mission. The Bible, it's 66 books of history, stories, letters, and poetry that fit together to form God's one big story. The epic adventure of how he created us and loves us so much that he made a way to rescue us. As we travel through the Bible, from Genesis to Revelation, we discover people who met God and found their lives changed forever. Now, for an amazing story, inspired by the book of Luke, Chapter 2, verses 25 through 35. The birth of Jesus was unusual in many ways. He entered the world in a shelter with the animals and was celebrated by an entire host of angels. Glory to God in the highest. But Mary and Joseph cared for Jesus as with any child. When he was about six weeks old, they prepared to present him to the Lord at the temple. The law says we must offer a sacrifice of two pigeons. Or doves. How is he six weeks old already? But as Mary and Joseph set out for Jerusalem with their firstborn son, someone was already waiting for them, a man named Simeon, and their stories were about to collide. Simeon had grown up in Jerusalem, faithfully worshiping God. He prayed daily. Lord. Help me understand your law. Help me serve you with my whole life. Simeon would have studied the scriptures, words from the prophets from hundreds of years before. The people who are now living in darkness will see a great light. They are now living in a very dark land, but a light will shine on them. What light, Lord? Over the years, Simeon continued to pray, to worship, and to seek God in the temple. God's Holy Spirit was with him. And one day, the Spirit made Simeon a promise. You will not die before you see the Lord's Messiah. Me? With my own eyes? Thank you, Lord. Simeon believed the promise and waited in joyful expectation. Will it be today, Lord? Simeon waited some more. Will it be this year, Lord? And then he waited still more. How about this decade. We aren't quite sure how long Simeon had to wait, but when his hair turned snow white, he was still waiting. Soon, Lord. Today, at last, Simeon received a new response. A temple courtyard? I I'm on my way. Uh, where's my cloak? My walking stick? God's spirit led Simeon straight up to the temple mount and into the courtyard. Simeon stood in the center of the courtyard, allowing the voices to wash around him. He wasn't quite sure what he was looking for, but he knew God would reveal it to him. A baby? Simeon turned quickly to see a young couple nearby. The man carried a pair of doves in a small cage, the usual sacrifice after a child was born. The woman cradled a tiny baby in her arms. Joseph, where do we go? Excuse me. Both the man and the woman looked up quickly. May I hold the child? <laughs> well, all right, yes. Simeon took the child gently into his arms. In the eyes of this infant, he saw the face of God, the rescuer, God's promised Messiah. His name is Jesus. Overwhelmed, Simeon turned his gaze toward heaven. Lord, 
you are the king over all. Now let me, your servant, go in peace. That is what you promised. My eyes have seen your salvation. You have prepared it in the sight of all nations. It is a light to be given to the Gentiles. It will be the glory of your people, Israel. Mary and Joseph stared in amazement. We knew he was special. This. Simeon looked down at the child, then glanced up at Mary and Joseph again. May the Lord bless you both. Gently, Simeon returned Jesus to his mother's arms. After a lifetime of waiting, Simeon was overjoyed to see the fulfillment of the promise God had given him so long ago.